Today's July 15th, 2021, and my guest is journalist and author Jonathan Rausch. His latest book and the topic of today's conversation is The Constitution of Knowledge, a deep look at how we know what we know, or at least what we think we know, how that's been changed in the internet age and what might be done to make it better. Uh, Jonathan was last here in September of 2008 talking about the Chevy Volt and corporate culture a long time ago. Jonathan, welcome back to Econ Talk. I am happy to be here. One of my favorite shows. We should Thank do it you. more often. You got it. I think 13 years is a little long for <laughs> in between episodes. Um, you're lucky I'm still around. What What do you mean by the the Constitution of Knowledge? It's a lovely title. Uh, what do you, What do you mean by it? It's our system collectively as a society for figuring out what's true and what's not true, and doing that in a way that respects our our freedom and keeps us sane and keeps us civil. Uh, every society, large and small, needs a way to do that. Many, many societies have broken up over questions of, of truth, of fact. Um, Western societies, wars rage across Europe and many other places until we got a constitution of knowledge, which says, you know what, instead of having rulers make decisions about facts, let's have rules to do it. And we set up a system to do that. It looks a lot like the U.S. Constitution in many ways. And that's the constitution of knowledge. Well, you say we set it up. Uh, the Constitution of the United States was hammered out by a group of people. But as you point out a number of times uh, in the book, uh, there's a parallel between the Constitution of Knowledge, the, that is the process by which we try to figure out peacefully what is true and what isn't true, and the marketplace, the economic system we have, where they're both decentralized. They both rely on quite a bit on competition and on the norms and feedback loops that, that really sustain it and make it do positive things and not just um, randomly produce outcomes. I, I was struck with what you just said about the wars because you know, I used to like to quote, I haven't done it in a while, but I like to quote Walter Williams who said, in the old days, if you wanted to get rich, you hit your neighbor over the head with a stick and took, took your neighbor's stuff. And capitalism was a way, markets were a way to, for a lot of people to get rich instead of in a zero sum game strategy. Similarly, if you kill someone, have a war to, to make them believe what you think is true, it's not as effective as what you outlined in the Constitution of Knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, that's exactly well, right. Well, it might and, be more effective, but it's not as nice. <laughs> and then the same is true of the U.S. Constitution. There is the disanalogy that you mentioned that the U.S. Constitution was written down by a group of people in a room. But as I say again and again in the book, the real U.S. Constitution isn't it only starts with the words on paper. What it really is, is all the norms, the institutions, things like political parties and judicial review and popular sovereignty and, um, and all the many things that built up. And the same is true of the Constitution of Knowledge. It's, it wasn't written down to begin with, but it was set up by human beings. It does have rules. It was conscious about that. It has lots of institutions. The big four branches of it are research, which is academia and science, of course. Second is the world of journalism, the world I come from, also fact-based, also professionals trying to figure out what's true in a disaggregated, decentralized way. The third is the world of law. Now, people don't know this, but the idea of a fact originally comes from law, predates the world of science, because you had to have some facts in common in order to figure out how to rule in a law case. And the fourth is government, which has to be reality-based in order to function. And until 2017, January 20th, um, was fact-based and still mostly is. So those are the big four. And they all function using a set of rules and lots of institutions, lots of settings that you have to get right, which is the problem with the standard metaphor for where knowledge comes from, the marketplace of ideas. That assumes free speech is enough. And that leaves us vulnerable because... You need to get a lot of settings, a lot of institutions, you get a lot of rules in place, a lot of professionals, and those are easy to attack and are under attack. So that's the idea of my book. Let's talk about the informal norms, because I think they're so so important in, in all these worlds that we're talking about, the, the world that produces knowledge, the world that produces political outcomes that the Const U.S. Constitution mediates. Um, and the commercial world, of course, the, the world that, that marked real, what we would normally call real markets, uh, what they deal with. And, and norms, 
you know, norms are underrated. Uh, and I think the last five to 10 years as the internet has ramped up and the world has changed, a lot of norms that used to, I think, sustain decency and human behave, human civilized outcomes have been degraded. Uh, the behavioral expectations of people in, I would say, in academic life, in journalism and in politics have all uh, taken a hit. You know, you've all been, I'm sure you know his book, A Time to Build. He was on here talking about it, that so many people use their platform as a place to perform rather than a place to be obligated to a duty to the to the institution. And I think some of what's going on is that degradation of the institutions as the norms have deteriorated. Well, you're a college president, so you're in some ways in a better position than I am to speak of that. And your job is going to be to defend those those norms against some of the trends that Yuval is talking about. Yeah, Yuval Levin's wonderful book, A Time to Build. I should be plugging my book. I should be, they tell you what you do, you hold it up three times at least. There it is. Available at yeah, a bookstore near you. And for those of you listening on the audio only, it's a lovely, it's a lovely cover. And you're missing out. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to plug Yuval Levin's book because it's been such an inspiration to my own. And and Levin notes that no society can function without functioning institutions that shape us as people. You know, that's the journalism profession that I came into, the newsrooms that shaped me by really hammering it into me that I've got to get it right. I've got to be accurate. I've got to check. I've got to double source. I've got to go back to people before I write about them. I've got to run corrections if I'm wrong, even though I'm not happy about it and no one else is happy about it. Institutions shape us. And that's very true of the constitution of science. Unlike the um, commercial marketplace, the constitution of science, the reality-based community is mostly a professional network because it takes typically years in any of these fields, law, journalism, uh, public administration, and especially science to get up to speed, to understand the ideas, to get the jargon, the education, to learn the literature, to build a track record so that others know that you're on the level. Um, so it's very much a professional network and it relies heavily on a lot of unwritten rules. And they range from obvious things like you can't make stuff up in, in regular life, you know, people make stuff up all the time or you can't believe stuff just because somebody told you and you think it might be true. You know, you, you can't do QAnon in science or journalism. You have to be fact based. That's really hard. And all of those norms can be undermined. And I argue in the book that there are two big attacks on them right now. One of them um, is from the outside, and that's from people who are using disinformation and other forms of epistemic warfare. Uh, and the force at the center of that right now in America is Donald Trump and MAGA and his movement. Very, very dangerous. But the other is the one that you mentioned, Russ, and that's from the inside. And that's factions that come into academia, increasingly journalism, and seek to politicize it, uh, seek to erode the norms that what really matters is accuracy above all, and that we shouldn't be following political agendas, we should be seeking and following facts. Sometimes it's hard to know the difference, but where our hearts should be, what we should be striving to do is keep political agendas out of it. And there has been a pretty serious diminution of that at a lot of institutions. Yeah, we'll come back and talk about both of those. Um, I'm going to bring in an economist perspective I, that I think is important to to add to the just sort of the cultural trends that we're dealing with. And some of those cultural trends, I, I fear, are the result of the incentives, which is the economist perspective. But before we get there, um, I want to talk about the Constitution and knowledge in its ideal form, which you are quite eloquent and and uh, thoughtful. Uh, it's lovely to have a book like this where you get to actually show some nuance and <laughs> let the reader understand the subtlety of, of what you're talking about. Um, and we won't do justice to that in the next 15 minutes or so of trying to to cover that. But but I really like that part of the book where you try to give the flavor of what is actually going on. But at, at a higher level, it, it's sort of a, um, a bird's eye view. You talk about the epistemic funnel, the way that ideas get turned into what we have as knowledge and in particular, the importance of its being 
shared knowledge, which I have not really seen people emphasize enough. You draw on Charles Peirce, who's a personal favorite of mine and almost never gets mentioned outside this program. So I'm thrilled that he's in your book in, in a number of places. But talk about that epistemic funnel and the rules and norms and institutions that take the myriad of ideas down to uh, what we would call shared knowledge. Well, I'd love to because that really goes to the heart of the matter. And it also relates to what I said earlier, the marketplace of ideas is not enough. So most people, uh, most of the ideas that most people have about what's true and what's not true most of the time are wrong, just wildly wrong. It's the human condition. We're in a state of yeah. a bum, bumbling error most of the time where, you know, we're pretty good at immediate problems that affect our lives and demand and give us immediate feedback. Like, you know, is that a tiger in the bush or just a breeze or where's the next tribe camp? But we're not good at all at bigger abstract questions. Like what's the cause of the disease that's, that's uh, decimating our, our society, our tribe, or where's the next, uh, or pardon me, or, or which God do we worship? And those we tend to be deeply in error because we're riddled with cognitive biases we, and we look for evidence and actually perceive favorably evidence that, that favors, uh, that helps us with status or that favors our point of view. Really, Make, really makes us feel good. Makes us feel good. Yeah, that's pretty much how we choose ideas. And the result of that is that most of what people want to believe on any given day is not just wrong, but wildly wrong. So the question is, how can a society find that small fraction of 1% of people's ideas that actually advance knowledge? And that's finding needles in haystacks. And the way you do that is to set up a kind of, I, I liken it to a, a giant funnel the input end is free speech. That's the idea. Anyone can believe anything. Anyone can say just about anything. And that's the raw material for the reality-based community. But then it goes into this process of, I think of it as like a system of pumps and filters. Many, many nodes in this network. Most ideas are so screwball, they don't even get acquired. Like some people think Elvis is alive, but no research dollars. Well, I hope not at your university anyway, are going to be spent finding out why Elvis is still alive. Um, a small fraction of ideas will be acquired by the system and science and journalism will say, okay, we need to look at this. And then it'll be divided up into units that are refutable, that are checkable, it'll be parceled out, peer reviewers will look at it, editors will look at it. If it passes muster, and only some of them will, then it will be passed on, it'll be published. Then others can pick it up, they look at it, they do their own assessment. Um, over time, and actually pretty darn quickly, through all of these nodes in this network of checkers, I think of them as like being pumping and filtering stations, the good stuff drips out at the end of the funnel, a very narrow end in which on any given day is new knowledge, a tiny, tiny, minuscule, precious fact, uh, fraction of what goes in. Uh, this is a way, what it does is two things. First, it converts information, which is free and cheap and mostly wrong, into knowledge, which is very expensive and very precious and is humanity's greatest resource. Objective knowledge is a species transforming invention. It put the shot in my arm that's protecting me from COVID. Yeah. It's changes from small tribal societies in which knowledge essentially never grows from generation to generation to one in which we now add more to the canon of human knowledge any day, any one day than we did in 200,000 years. But also very importantly, it gives us a way to settle disputes, to work very quickly through these mass of, of ideas um, and do that in a way that's peaceful and that's decentralized that no one can take control of. No prince or priest or politburo can say, okay, Russ Roberts, here's what you're teaching at your university today, because we think it's true. They can do that in China, um, in the Soviet Union, um, in Jonestown, in religious sects. Most human societies function that way, not this way. But this is the only way that gives you peace and knowledge. And by the way, freedom. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, as, as I mentioned before, and, and you allude to it, but you, you don't write about it quite as much as I would, which is the competition part, right? Because there's all these nodes trying to get, they're not just devoted to truth, they're devoted to the rewards that come with adding that knowledge. So it could be a published paper, it could be a tenure position, 
could be a front page story on your paper or a, po a position in a magazine. Um, and the thing I, I worry about, and sorry, again, I want to just praise what you, what you wrote. There's, it's a beautiful exposition of the ideal. Of course, in real life, it doesn't work quite as well as, as that romantic story you just told. One of the temptations is to extend the norms and institutions that work very well in science and extend them into places that don't work quite as well and to make them look that way, they do the way they do in science. So I would say, you know, social science struggles to be as reliably knowledgeable about what it claims to know than, quote, real science. Real science also has trouble, right? But uh, my worry is in my field and in, in the other so social sciences that scientism, not science, scientism, the trappings of science are evoked because they're rewarding monetarily and they encourage people to make claims that aren't quite as reliable as as they are in certain field, other fields. Comment on that if you would. Yeah, I'm going to comment by pushing back. Um, yeah. What I described is not the ideal, it's how it actually works. And that isn't to say that any human social system is perfect, but if you think of what this system is doing in what is it, December or so of 2019, a new virus is discovered within a period of weeks, actually days, but certainly weeks, hundreds of thousands of expert minds in all kinds of disciplines around the world are spontaneously without centralized control organized, um, pivot to solve that problem. Hundreds, if not thousands of institutions go to work on it within a period of a couple of weeks. It's sequenced. Within a period of a couple of days, a vaccine is designed, um, and now it's in my arm and less than a year later. That's an incredible feat of human organization. Uh, no, it's, it's species transforming. And now you're going to say, well, that's an example of science, but it breaks it down is. when you try to bring it to economics and to other fields. And I say, no, okay. um, of, I, I'm against scientism, um, but scientism is just basically lazy practice where you're trying to look for shortcuts by using methods that may not apply in your field. But the bigger point, Russ, be curious if you agree or disagree with this, is that the constitution of knowledge can organize any kind of debate or argument, including even, weirdly enough, theology, which is the definition of something that's non-scientific. It can't resolve adjudicate every kind of dispute because a lot of stuff like literary criticism, it's just much harder to find evidence that people can agree is dispositive. That's the nature of the field. Chemistry, it's relatively easy. E economics, I don't know where you'd put it, but probably somewhere in between. Um, and that's the nature of the beast. And, you know, we got to live with that. But there is no kind of social argument about truth that cannot be organized by the principles of using decentralized methods of checking, of debate, structuring this around looking at what you can check and giving that priority. And that, in fact, works, I argue, for literary criticism. It even works for moral disputes like abortion. It doesn't resolve them in a crisp way. That's asking too much but it does give us a way of approaching them which says, okay, abortion, what kind of arguments can we bring to bear on this that would be persuasive to any reasonable person? What kind of evidence do we have about the development of fetus? What can we say about the history of ethics? Um, it gives us a way to approach these ideas in an organized fashion, and that's so crucial compared to all the alternatives. So I'm going to disagree, but before I do, I do want to say that there's a gorgeous two paragraphs or so in your book where you defend uh, religion. I don't want anyone to think that the in that from that last remark that you think that theology is is some weird, goofy thing that doesn't have evidence. And so, but we can still make some progress or something. But you actually talk very eloquently, beautifully in the book about uh, with respect for the aspects of religion and science and that they're not in conflict. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah. Um, maybe a better way to say it is that one of the great attributes of the constitution of science is that it is a liberal system and liberal systems are liberal. The word is free because they don't insist on dominating every part of our lives. So the U S constitution does not govern 
what we do in our family dining table or what we do in prayer at church. It has its specific realm. And when it's behaving, it stays there. And the same is true of the constitution of knowledge. We don't have to be professional truth seekers doing experiments when we're in church. We're left alone there in our realm of personal beliefs. The constitution of knowledge only applies where we need to make public decisions about truth or falsehood. And it says, okay, here's how we're going to structure those arguments. And that's a revolution for human freedom, right? Because other epistemic systems say, no, we're going to control your entire life. You're never allowed to dissent because dissent is a threat to the regime. And of course, as as we worry somewhat in this current atmosphere that we're in, in a really powerful totalitarian state, not only are you not free to say what you want, you're really not so free to even think what you want. There's a natural incentive to curb your um, – any – thoughts, ideas that might get you in prison. And in, in the modern times, again, we'll talk about it in a minute, but the the fear that you'll say the wrong thing I think is incredibly uh, dangerous in, in reducing the power of the mechanisms that you're talking about. But just to come back to this issue of um, – Scientism? Social science and scientism. You know, in 1940, you didn't make – particularly good living as an academic or a journalist, but you did it because you loved it and it made your heart sing and it was you know, psychologically rewarding. Today, if you're at the top of those two fields, you make an enormous amount of money, only at the very top, but you do make an enormous amount of money. The stakes are much higher and I, I think – and it's true in science as well. And it's distorted, I think, some of the natural norms that protected us the, the liberal order you're talking about. And again, to remind listeners, liberal here does not mean politically liberal, but the freedom to write what you want, say what you want, take a stand. All those things I think have been challenged, awkward for me to say as a free market guy, but it's been challenged by the by the monetary rewards in these professions mm. and the monetary incentives that I think have made it much more likely that people will make broad Ball, uh, bold claims that aren't necessarily true. They will dismiss alternatives without admitting that they might be true. Uh, what gets rewarded is certainty rather than subtlety. So I think those are huge problems in – I think they're true in every field today particularly, but I think they're particularly true in journalism and, and economics. And I think from the inside, economists tend to think they're just truth seekers. They don't respond to those incentives. I know journalists feel that way. I've talked to them a zillion times about it. They hate being told that they might be responding to incentives. I understand that, but I do think it's a serious, I think it's a serious problem. Do you agree? Well, I don't know much about economics, uh, at least the economic structure of the field, and I'd like to know more. Uh, are, are you seeing this as distorting the, the, the product of economics? Are you seeing it in, in bad science, so to speak? And, I think and what, are, I think it's what are we talking about? Are we talking about sort of consultants making a lot of money, but telling clients what they want to hear? Or um, what? Give me an example. What I have in mind is, you know, I, 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 I didn't keep the paragraph that I meant to save it, but you talked about how much, how much has been published about COVID. Mm -hmm. How many articles, how many peer reviewed articles? It might be 100,000. I mean, I, I can't remember from your, from your book. It's a, it's a giant number. It's, so it's not just the vaccine. And by the way, that vaccine talked about on the program before. One of the reasons it was produced so quickly is we had an enormous army in waiting of chemists, biochemists, epidemiologists, and others who could spring into action because they were on, pay, on the payroll of – and we pro I think we probably have too many. But it turned out to have a good side effect, which was because we've subsidized the pharmaceutical industry so much – when we needed them, they were there to help us, and I think it's a glorious thing. Don't misunderstand me. But I think the the, the academic work that came out of this uh, pandemic that's not the vaccine, that is, did lockdowns work? How about masks? I, I still don't see it as being so advancing of our knowledge, and in particular in the social science. So what I'm suggesting is, is that 99 percent of the peer reviewed articles that, that get published are not adding to knowledge. They're just adding to the resumes of the people who wrote the articles. And I think that's a product of the, of the financial incentives that academic life has in the, in the United States and other parts of the world today. And I think that's tragedy. Uh, it's a reality, but I think people make claims that, you know, now you, you're, 
One answer would be, well, but they get tested eventually and they get refuted. The ones that aren't credible can't be replicated. It's true. But I think the whole system is not nearly as uh, the norms that would that used to be there have been have been pretty much destroyed. But, but let me pick on journalism because that's easier because that's your inside yeah, world. I know. Let me let me leave mine you know, alone. It, you know, in the last five years, it, it, you could argue whether it's a, a response to Trump or whether it's Trump was responding to it. I don't really care. But the journalists that that I follow on Twitter, they don't act the way journalists acted ten years ago. They're openly partisan. They're openly uh, dismissive. They distort things all the time. Um, they lie. You could call it lying. Now you could argue, but they don't lie as much as the politicians, whether it's Trump or whoever you don't like. It's true, but they lie a lot more than they did twenty years ago, and I, I think that's deeply disturbing. And I think the reason they do it is very simple. There's a reward to doing it, and their publications, their institutions, without eyeballs. Are going to die. It's not like in the past where you had a nice, comfy situation with only a handful of producers of information. Now it, the the marketplace is wide open, and if you do not energize your followers with anger, fear, and other motives and other results, you don't get eyeballs. And I think that's a huge problem. Well, there are a lot of problems with journalism. Uh, I wouldn't put that one at top. I'd put it somewhere in the middle of the pack. Uh, <laughs> okay. Most of what journalists do is not being on Twitter. And I'm one of those people who regrets the turn to Twitter. The turn to Twitter, actually, it was encouraged in the early days of social media. Yeah. Media right. organizations thought you've got to be on social media. They told all their staffs, get a Twitter account, start <laughs> tweeting. Believe me, they regret doing that. I have talked to editors at some of the country's leading publications who say that they would give their eye teeth to get these reporters off Twitter, but they can't do it at this point because the reporters have brands and it's um, most journalists actually behave responsibly on Twitter and tweet about a story that they wrote and then, you know, put in the headline and put in the link. But some don't. And those are the ones that stick in your mind, unfortunately. That's a problem. Sure. Um, sure. It's not the biggest problem. I think there are, there are two problems that are significantly bigger. The biggest problem is we're back to economics again, but it's the lack of a business model. And it's the fact that yeah. all of the things that we're talking about, making knowledge, um, doing it right. It's very expensive. And some of the stuff that you talk about in academia that's just published because it's easy and because it pads someone's resume and maybe helps get them you know, to the next appointment. Well, some of that is just because that's the cheap and easy way to do it, right? Yeah. Um, really advancing the frontiers of knowledge can be very, very costly. And journalism, investigative reporting, very expensive. Opinion is cheap and easy. Yeah. And that's a problem we haven't solved. And it's fundamentally, it's an economic problem. Because I can tell you, yeah. journalists are very unhappy. Um, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. You just, said it better, you just said it better than I did. And then is... there's a, a second problem, which I think ranks significantly above tweeting, though I, I do worry about you know, the social media forms of corruption that, and temptation that that introduced. But that's the diminishing ideological diversity in newsrooms. That's an even bigger problem. In fact, it's, a, I think, a major problem in academia, at, at least in the social sciences and humanities, where you can walk a country mile and not find anyone who voted for Trump or even for Mitt Romney. I think that's begun to distort a lot of fields in the humanities, economics somewhat less. Yeah. Um, but we see the same thing in journalism. And there are a couple problems with that. One is it distorts the product. We can never see our own errors. We can never see our own biases. The genius of the constitution of knowledge is it says, I don't have to see my biases, but you'll see them for me and you'll correct them or someone else will correct both of us because we don't see our own biases and errors. If you've got a newsroom that's got only progressives, they're not going to get the reporting right because there are questions that they're going to forget to ask. There are distortions that are going to creep into the news copy. Um, and that's a problem in itself because it means we're not serving our audiences well or doing our job as well as we should. But it's also bad for our credibility as journalists because other people who are not progressives read us and see these assumptions that we're missing. So I would fix the Twitter problem if I could. I don't know how. But before that, or at least in addition to it, I would challenge more journalistic publications to work harder to make sure that there is 
a critical mass of conservatives on the staff, of libertarians, of people who think differently. And I would be extremely wary of social dynamics in newsrooms, like we saw at one major paper last year, where you see a faction of politicized journalists rise up to get someone fired because he's publishing or saying conservative things. That should never happen. Well, that's what I meant. I didn't mean to suggest Twitter was the biggest problem. What you just said is what I think is the biggest problem, which is the illusion that I think some people have that that uh, the biggest competitor for CNN is Fox News. CNN's biggest competitor isn't Fox News. It's MSNBC. And the New York Times' biggest competitor isn't the Wall Street Journal. It's the Washington Post or the Boston Globe. You pick it some other online opportunity. And so adding the diversity that you're talking about, which I think is lovely, ends up losing you the audience that a publication might have to people who aren't aren't going to be so diverse because they want their their viewers and listeners don't care so much about diversity. They want to get angry or feel good about themselves. I think the biggest problem we have, and it's a human problem that can't be solved overnight, is that I don't think people care very much about the truth. If you care about feeling good about themselves or comforting themselves or getting angry at people that I think are worth getting angry at. And I think the internet has allowed that to be on steroids. And um, because of competition, they're forced into those partisan ideological boxes. And it's horrible. It's horrible on the left. And it's just as horrible on the right, obviously. Um, I think it's worse on the right, actually. Could be. Doesn't matter. They're both basically people listen to one all day long whether it's on the left or the right. And as a result, they get angrier. And if you said to them, don't you think we should have some other voices on here? They'd say, if you do that, I'm going I'm to change the channel. <laughs> there's, there's some of that. It's the human condition. And you're correct that, that um, digital media has put that on steroids by making it possible to measure the clicks for every headline. Um, and that's very easy to follow your audiences down all kinds of rabbit holes. But um, on the hopeful side, we've been through something a bit like this in 19th century American journalism. And we saw similar patterns, which is you had the invention of the penny press, which basically meant that newspapers now had subscribers, which means they had bases of people who were expecting certain things, party lines. And then you had the inventing of offset printing, which allowed you to have these giant presses and the huge spools of newsprint that allowed you to print, you know, 200,000 copies of a newspaper in your basement overnight. And these led to a race to the bottom where everyone was trying to catch, capture eyeballs. And in 19th century journalism, you wound up with basically a kind of a swamp, a fetid swamp of fake news and hyper-partisanship, because that's where it seemed like the readers wanted to go. That's where you were making money. And if you'd been alive to have this conversation with me back then, we both would have thrown up our hands and say, this is terrible and there's no way to get out of it. <laughs> right. So how did we get out of it? And the answer is incentives and institutions, which is kind of the way we always get out of these doom loops, right? Um, the environment, the information environment that was being created back then was toxic for the business model in the long term. Um, you, you know, you can only publish so much stuff that's, that's fake and extremely outrageous before people get on with their lives and want to do something less toxic. Um, it was bad for the country. And a lot of people didn't like it. People in journalism realized this was unsustainable. So... In the early part of the 20th century, they formed institutions like the American Society of Newspaper Editors. The first thing they did was start promulgating some professional standards and ethics codes like don't make stuff up, be accurate, run corrections, things that we take for granted now. Well, someone had to come up with that. And then they had the development of journalism schools, professional schools that basically inculcated those norms, said they're right and wrong ways to do things. And then those people found out into the process. And then you had the incentives. This I know is dear to your heart, Russ. In all of the constitution of knowledge, it relies much more heavily on rewards than on punishments, which is really, as you know, the thing that works in a society. And 
in journalism, they set up a bunch of prizes. Ironically, the biggest is the Pulitzer, which is named after a yellow journalist news baron. Um, but there are lots of other formal prizes and informal prizes in the form of if I write a great story, others will pick it up, I'll get more famous. So they began building an incentives to use journalism responsibly and to make it truth seeking and fact based. And that in turn retrained the audience. People then said, wait, OK, this is valuable to me. I like this. This is sustainable. And that gets us in a period of about 40 years, still a long time. But it gets us from yellow journalism to Edward R. Murrow and what's now considered, I think, rightly a golden age for American journalism. So the question becomes, can we establish institutions and incentives that will reverse the flow so that instead of rewarding people for fake news, cheap opinion, uh, outrage, we can begin start rewarding ourselves and retraining ourselves for other incentives. We have done it before. Um, can we do it again? Not sure. Um, I'm hopeful. I'm not optimistic, but I'm, I'm hopeful. I think we're well, seeing signs of that happening, maybe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you articulate that hope in a minute. Uh, after I'm going to make a point, though, of a related to yours, which is, you know, the standards you talk about, they get articulated, which is huge, right? Just articulating them is not unimportant. There were often no formal ways to enforce them. It was a, it was a, a guild where your honor was at stake, that you lived by these rules. No one monitored you. No one – there was, they're imprecise rules, and they're not easily enforced because they're not precise. And I think about, I think about doctors, I think about academics, I think about journalists. I feel again that all those fields, the internal monitoring that we do in our day-to-day -day lives, has somehow fallen by the wayside to some extent. I, I think I mentioned on the program before, you know, my mom goes in to the doctor and the first thing they do is they give her an EKG. And this is like a post surgery visit. I'm thinking, mom, why'd they give you an EKG? Didn't you just have one the two days earlier in the, you know, whatever. And she said, well, they always give me one. And I'm thinking, sure they do. Cause it's just like, ching -ching. and it, I'm making it sound like there was, uh, that it was somewhat reasonable at the time. I thought there's no reason for this. It's totally just a, a fake procedure that they're doing. Cause you know, that's what they do, and they ring it up. Uh, you know, they give you the the anesthesiologist from outside your your coverage, and they don't even they don't ask you. Now, one view is they don't ask you because they never usually ask, and people don't usually care, and because a lot of times it is covered. But then there's the times that aren't, and people get stuck with it. And it's like, why would you treat somebody that way? Why why would you give them procedure that they might not need? Why wouldn't you have a conversation with them? And I just think there's so many internal norms that that practitioners in medicine and dentistry and law and other areas used to have. And now it's like, well, it's a lot of money. Again, there's a lot of money at stake. Let's just, you don't have to ask. And a lot of it's subsidized, of course, is part of the problem. A lot of people aren't spending their own money. And I'm talking about medicine. Uh, a lot of times the students aren't paying the tuition. They're not the real customer in the, in the university. So I just feel in many, many areas, the internal uh, mores of culture that used to enforce excellence People just kind of gotten kind of sloppy. Do you think that's fair? I wouldn't know how to measure that. No, um, I wouldn't either. And, you know, uh, data is not the plural of anecdote. So, no. and, and, you know, I'd be crazy to deny that there are perverse economic incentives that are just, just riddling American medicine. That's, but to me, that's, that's the problem. I guess I'm not really too well equipped to to address. Um, I, I am more prepared to address some of the specific forms of politicization, and some would call them corruption. I think that's fair in many cases that have crept into these disciplines um, because certain ideologies come along in the past. You know, things like Marxism and then postmodernism, and and now there are aspects of critical race theory and others. You basically have imperialistic ambitions and say, you got to toe this line. You've got to take this line or else you're not doing science. And that's an anti-scientific attitude. Um, 
those, I'm not sure I'd argue it's worse today. I, I think I might argue that we've always had those problems and that we rely on professional norms, which are very delicate in many ways to push back. And one of the reasons I wrote this book is to get people to push back, to be our best selves, um, to remember the constitution of knowledge is there. It requires a lot of us. This is the biggest message of my book. The notion of a marketplace of ideas in which free speech is enough and everything else is self-maintaining is completely wrong. You need to have all of these structures and incentives. You need to understand them. They were made by humans for humans. And then you need to you need to protect them. You need to get them right. You need to be in a position to call out the kinds of distortions when you see them that we're talking about. And that's why I wrote this book. Um, I am concerned that these distortions in inside the constitution of knowledge are becoming costly and maybe dangerous. And I'm certain that distortions outside from propagandists and other forms of epistemic warfare are a real threat. Well, let me come back to the U.S. Constitution. When we used to talk about this more on the program, I'd make the point that you know, the Constitution used to restrain certain political outcomes. And now, basically, the Constitution doesn't really restrain anything other than gun ownership and um, some freedom of speech. But in the economic sphere, uh, things that used to be up for grabs in terms of whether they were constitutional or not, it's like, well, it's con if, if Congress votes on it, it's probably fine. We don't we, – Somewhere in the New Deal and, and around there, the role of the Constitution in restraining the economic power of the government was lost. And there, one counter argument to that is, yeah, well, but if people don't really believe in it, if people just want, quote, good laws, even if they're unconstitutional, it doesn't really matter what the Constitution says. That implicit, as you said earlier, the sort of living part of the Constitution, the organic part of the Constitution is relevant, is, is, is as relevant as, as uh, the piece of paper. But what happens then is that, you know, in the old days, if I said to a, to a member of Congress, you know, it's really not right to funnel a lot of business to your constituents just because they're yours. Uh, that's not right. Shouldn't you put the base, the military base or whatever it is in the right place for it? And they eventually convince themselves when there's no real constitute, no paper constitution that restrains them. Well, if the other guy's doing it and I don't do it, I'll be, I'm going to lose my job. And I, so everybody starts to behave in a way that was morally unacceptable. You just say, well, that'd be wrong. I wouldn't do that. And then it becomes sort of like, well, if you don't, you lose your job. And then it's like, yeah, that's kind of the way the system works. And I worry that's the kind of loss of internal monitoring that I feel we've, we've had across many, many institutions. Do you think that's worrisome, real? Um, no, I think we got okay. too little, too few earmarks. Pork barrel spending has become too difficult. I think the world of politics is much harder and more difficult than economists realize. And the notion that technocrats should decide where things go on the basis of efficiency does not understand that a Madisonian system relies on building coalitions in a peaceful way. And that's extremely difficult. And one of the ways that you do that is Indeed, one of the hardest things to do is cut spending. And if you want to cut Medicare, for example, well, it's going to be pretty darn helpful to be able to call Representative Roberts and say, I know this is a tough vote for you, but you know that second runway at the airport in your district you've been asking for? I think we can do that this time. Well, maybe no planes are going to land there. Maybe it's a runway to nowhere, but that's how politics works. Um, so I'm, you know, I've, this is a separate conversation, but you might want to have a Look at my little mini book. It's really an article. It's called Political Realism, How Hacks, Machines, Big Money, and Backroom Deals Can Strengthen American Democracy. And I think we've actually gone, a combination of libertarians and progressives and conservatives have gone too far in moralizing against all of that stuff and thinking that we could substitute some kind of clean system in which politicians have less discretion. And the result is the chaos that we now see. How's that, Russ? That's awesome. Did I, I throw down totally. the gauntlet there or what? Yeah, I, lo I loved it, except the the implication that I think technocrats should decide where things go. I just want government to be less powerful. But I take the point. It's, an, it's a really interesting observation that that the system – and it, it runs through this book. It's, I haven't read your other book. I'm sorry, but it runs through this book, the idea that you know you don't get exactly what you want. Almost no one does. You've got to compromise in the, in the political arena and that that's healthy. In all kinds of ways, even though you might not like any one outcome. I, so I, that part, 
I, I, I like your creative. Beautifully stated. You wrap the whole thing up there in one elegant, <laughs> elegant loop. That was wonderful. Thank you, sir. Uh, but you should be a before, college president. Yeah, thanks. I'm working at it. Uh, I play one on TV or on, on the internet, I guess. Um, before we leave, I, I want to get a little close with with some discussions of, of where we might encourage that hope and optimism that could be there. But before we do, I, I just want you to talk about the two principles that underlie the um, the constitutional knowledge that we haven't mentioned yet. We, you talk about liberal science, um, meaning the freedom to explore and, and test ideas and just the two ideas, no final say and no personal authority. And the reason I like that, first of all, it's, it's only two. It's fantastic. I know it's not the whole story, but they are hugely important. And I think they have something to say for our own personal lives, not just for the system of constitutional um, – the constitutional knowledge. So talk about what those principles mean and uh, why they're important, and then maybe we'll talk about the personal side. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to hear your reflections on how they inflect our personal lives. Um, so what I call liberal science, also the constitutional knowledge, this whole system that we have of figuring out what's true and what's false by essentially – um, outsourcing it to a giant social network. Uh, it, it, a lot of things go on there, as you say, but there are two rules that are at the heart of it. And wherever those rules are followed socially by people, you'll see the emergence of something that looks a lot like modern science, a lot like modern journalism and law. The first is no final say. This is a radical new idea that says no matter how certain you are, you might be wrong. And so might everyone else. And that means you need to put in place a system where, first of all, any idea can be exploded because it might have something to contribute to correcting an error somewhere. And second, no one's allowed to be in charge of this process. No one's allowed to come along and say, OK, you can say X, but you cannot say Y, because Y might be right. You never know. So that sets up an open-ended process of constant criticism and checking. And that's a revolution in human affairs. No one had thought of that until basically the the mid uh, the mid 1600s. Uh, that's the underpinning. It's called the fallibilist rule. That's the underpinning of but not only free speech but the whole error checking system we rely on. The second is no personal authority, and this one's equally revolutionary and even harder to implement. And this says, okay, so how are you going to figure out what's right and what's wrong? Well, you can't do it by saying God revealed it to you, or by saying I'm the dictator. Um, I'm, I'm the president of the country. I'm going to tell you what's right. You know, you can't just say I'm, I'm Xi Jinping. So here's what's true. No one gets authority just simply based on who they are. So whatever you do to check an idea, you're going to have to persuade other people who are not like you because no one's in a position to take control of the, of the argument. So this basically says you're going to have empiricism. It's going to me mean checking what you believe. And that's going to mean that you should be able in principle to convince any reasonable person. If you're doing an experiment, it should be replicable for anybody, not just for people in your tribe or people who share your religion. If you're making an argument, it should make sense to people who speak an entirely different language and come from a totally different discipline. Um, this allows you to create a global network of truth seekers, the reality-based community who are bringing many different points of view to essentially one reality. They all have to be interoperable. They have to be able to plug in and talk to each other, admittedly from different disciplines. But that gives you the scale that we now have where you can have hundreds of thousands of minds pivoting and working on the same problem from many points of view. Um, so those are the two rules that basically become the foundation of science, journalism, law, all the rest. And the rest elaborates on those but they are species transforming. And as you said, and I think you say it more thoroughly in the book, we haven't really devoted enough time to it. It's not just then what you think is true. It's what's widely accepted as true, but not as a form of group thing. It's because it's been tested and shared and pushed back on and so on. And I, of course, we, we come to believe things that aren't true. You know, Moby Dick is the greatest American novel. No, I'm kidding about that. It could be. I have no idea. But uh, we come to believe serious things that are so-called sci actually scientific and amenable to, pr to prove that turn out not to be true, right? You know, the lonely 
you know, you know, there's so many tragic examples of this. The lonely scientist who steps forward with a crazy theory that, you know, ulcers are actually not coming from worry. It's actually a bug who says that, you know, that Africa and South America used to fit together. <laughs> it was like, oh, come on. Uh, or Homo, that, homo, uh, Here's one close to my heart. Homosexuality is not in any way pathological. A crazy yeah, idea yeah. that Evelyn Hooker right. floated in the 40s and 50s. That myth, which had been deeply established in psychiatry, thanks to the work of some non-empirical people, um, caused devastating harm to generations of people like me. Well, someone comes along in the 50s and actually does experiments and says, you know, gives a bunch of psychological tests to people who are gay and people who are straight, and then takes the label off and shows them to a panel of psychiatrists and, tell, and says, tell me which ones are gay. <laughs> they can't do it because yeah. there's no difference in their mental health. So another example, one that's very close to my heart. Yeah, and my point about courage though and heroism are these people who step forward. The one I always think of is Semmelweis who says, you know, the reason women are dying in childbirth is because doctors are poisoning them after visiting the morgue and then delivering a baby. And people think he's crazy because no one wants mm. to believe that. And he, the truth does eventually out in those situations, but it takes often decades and lots of death and suffering in between. But that process, uh, as you point out, is an extraordinary one. It is uh, very powerful. But the point I was going to make at the personal level is that no final say and no personal authority is not a bad way to live your life. You should be epistemologically humble in your own views. You should have strong opinions, opinions weakly held because you should be open to the possibility that you're fallible, right? Where you're just one human being and no personal authority. Don't rely on an expert who you trust to prove that, to decide what you believe. There are some you might learn from, many, but don't think of them as divine in any way. Um, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It's one of my most chilling experiences. I'll be trying to figure out if something, trying to find a fact to support an argument I'm making or an opinion and I'll start Googling around and I'll, looking for some, just like an insight that'll support what I think is true. And instead of finding something convincing, I find something I wrote 12 years ago. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's not reliable. I do what I wrote that. I, <laughs> has that ever happened to you? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> let's, let's close and talk about uh, what might reverse some of the degradation and destruction of the constitutional knowledge that the internet has wrought. Um, the book has a lot on uh, trolling the outrage, what I call the outrage epidemic. Uh, and I've talked about here. There's a lot. There's the book, a defense, the constitutional the knowledge, book. a defense of truth. Just mentioned the book. Yeah. By Jonathan Rausch, just uh, available where all fine books are sold. Um, but we also, you also talk a lot about cancel culture, which, you know, we're, we're not – we didn't spend much time on it here, but those are all being driven by the – by social media and the app and, and opportunities on the internet to um, – I like how you, you quote someone saying, uh, everybody's in a book club. You're the book, and they're uh, panning you or criticizing you. I like to think of it as someone can now go around and put a bumper sticker on your car that you drive around on, drive around with it that you didn't uh, choose to put there. So that's really disturbing. Um, what do you think we might do about that? What might make that better? Well, yeah, and why, are say, you, why are you hopeful? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's so much more fun to be pessimistic. I'm hopeful because optimism is too complacent. The idea that these problems just all go away if we wake them out. That's not true. If we don't defend the constitution of knowledge and redesign some of our personal expectations and behaviors, as you just said, and also some of our institutions and organizations, then it's not clear we keep the constitution of knowledge. It's what Ben Franklin famously said when asked what form of government the constitutional convention had produced. He said, a republic, if you can keep it. So optimism is too complacent, but pessimism is too fatalistic and in between is hope. And that means that people who are serious, who put their minds to it, to defending and understanding these institutions, I believe we'll be able to do so, but we got to do the work. So what does the work consist of? There's a hard thing about explaining this book, Russ, is that there's like not a three-point bullet list. It's going to involve um, 
fixing a lot of incentives and a lot of structures and a lot of institutions and no two will look quite alike. So at Facebook, um, I am very keen on the oversight board experiment because that's exactly the kind of thing that worked for journalism a hundred years ago. You start trying to see if you can develop some guidelines, some guardrails, some norms and principles. And then if they're pro-social, if they begin to work and improve the social media environment, then maybe others in social media will opt in and say, okay, that's a better way to do it. It's actually more attractive to our customers. It's actually better for the business model. Do we know that it will succeed? No. Do we know that it's moving, that it's trying the right kind of thing? Yeah, I think so. Um, and social media so-called platforms, I call them companies, um, it's going to mean a lot of technical tweaks behind the scenes uh, in terms of what their algorithms do. Right now, they promote a lot of stuff that's false because it gets eyeballs, but that's creating a toxic environment. There are a lot of really good minds trying to figure out how to do that um, or how to create private algorithm systems. So I can go buy an algorithm and plug it into Facebook or Twitter and get a feed that I think is going to be more truthful and reliable. All kinds of ideas there. Twitter is implementing stuff that seems small, but again, you're in the world of incentives and you understand that a series of fairly small incentives can dramatically change behavior. So for example, yesterday I tried to tweet out one of my own articles and I was interrupted by a splash screen that said, are you sure you want to tweet this without reading it first? Well, <laughs> I did cause I've written it, <laughs> but yeah, I've seen that's that. yeah. an effort to get people to, to, to stop and think and use their, um, their slow brain instead of their fast brain. And there's lots of efforts to do stuff like that. And there's going to be policy changes, but it's going to be about, there's going to be top down stuff like that, where these institutions and organizations begin to try to build in better structures and incentives. Um, and then there's the bottom up stuff. And those are the things that you and I can do. And that's what you just referred to earlier, Russ, which is why I'm so glad you said what you said. That's, am I going to retweet fake stuff just because it's fun? Am I going to take the burden of actually checking, for example, whether something is true? Am I going to join in on a trolling campaign or a cancel campaign? Or am I going to actually say, no, this is wrong. I'm going to, I'm going to stay away from this. Am I going to stay strictly accurate in what I teach in my classroom? Even when I tweet something, I personally, I try to check it. I try to make sure it's accurate. And I think that's the social norm that if individuals pursue that, we're not, certainly not, the best gauge of accuracy. Um, but it turns out actually that if you change incentives a little and you just prime people to consider accuracy when they're doing a social media post, um, actual experiments find that they do it better. And all you really have to do is prime them to care about accuracy with a statement like accuracy, you agree or disagree, accuracy really matters, is important in life. Um, so it's going to be top down, it's going to be bottom up, but it's got to be kind of an all of society multi-layered response. The bad news is that's really hard. Uh, the good news is we've done it before. The good news is markets are based on all kinds of incentives like that. The constitution of knowledge is too. We can't be complacent, but we also shouldn't assume that it's an impossible job. I'll just close with a crazy idea that, and let you react to it, which is um, I, I don't think the internet was was designed to destroy journalism or anything. It just happened. Uh, it's an outcome. And I wonder sometimes whether it's not just, it's not a vehicle for, um, and, and it, I just, I have to say it, most of the internet I love. <laughs> I think it's fabulous. I, I don't want to, uh, I love Twitter. There's a lot of things, uh, things I don't like about Twitter, things I don't like about the internet, but it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing. And I do have your hope that like many other innovations that we struggle with at first, we will figure out the norms and institutions that'll make it better. Maybe even the regulations, not my first choice, but could be true um, because I don't have any final say here. Uh, and I'm, and I'm a, I am believe in the fallibilist principle. But I, I do think there's an interesting aspect to this that, that you, you do talk about in the book and we've talked about many times here, which is tribalism. And you could argue that what the internet's really been good for is tribalism, a way to feel that you belong to something, whether it's through virtue signaling or ganging up on someone and especially anonymously, as you point out, it's part of the part of the problem. 
I wonder if we might think of some other ways to indulge our tribalism. You know, as religion is on the wane throughout the world, certainly in America. Uh, that was one way that we felt we belonged was, was through our religious life. Some people still have that, but the number's getting smaller. Um, maybe we can find other ways to feel connected to each other. Certainly the internet has the potential to do that in ways that are not outrage driven, not just virtue signaling. So that's, that's my area of hope. Well, there's nothing crazy or strange about that. It's a beautiful statement of the walk we've somehow got to walk. Um, and that's making not just the internet, but the constitution of knowledge and markets and democracy itself, um, figuring out ways to adapt that so that people feel it's responsive to their lives so they don't look for illiberal and dangerous and sociopathic alternatives and to find ways to deter people from and organizations from presenting sociopathic alternatives. And that's been a problem for every society since Plato's Republic. Plato got the wrong answer, which was a totalitarian, top-down, very hierarchical system. And we know that doesn't work. We know that what does work when we can do it is trying to create a form of liberalism, which provides a lot of good things to people, but doesn't try to provide everything and leave strong the realms of civic society, family, faith, um, and all the other goods of life that you know, science can't provide, journalism can't provide, government can't provide. Um, you got to have that part going too. My guest today has been Jonathan Rausch. His book is The Constitution of Knowledge. Jonathan, thanks for being part of EconTalk. Thank you for having me. And don't forget, go look for the book, available at fine bookstores everywhere. Thank you so You're much, here. Russ. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.